Thank you so much, choir and orchestra, for stirring our hearts and most of all bringing glory to the King, our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning I would like for you to open your Bible with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. And from 1 Corinthians we're going to look at chapter 3 and read verses 5 through 10. And this morning I'm going to be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. And we're going to look at some of the ways that we are partners with God. Now during the month of January, every year, I try to bring messages that will get us off to the right start for the new year. And this month we've talked about spiritual growth. We have uh, talked about faith. And today we're going to talk about our partnership with God. Next Sunday we're going to move back into our series from the book of Revelation and begin at chapter 12 as we continue our journey through that last book in God's Word. Now 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 5. What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, partners with God. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. In our day, we've become accustomed to people or corporations joining their labors. I can remember, as can many of you, when Exxon and Mobil were separate companies, but now they have joined. When Texaco and Chevron were different, but now they are one corporation. Before the banking crisis, Bank of America and Countrywide were two different corporations, but now they have merged. And even now, in the chemical industry, DuPont and Dow Chemical are in the process of merging. The truth is that most corporations now are owned by hundreds of people. Some of you work for a corporation or a business in which there is profit sharing. In a sense, you are a partner in that business. Some of you have worked for corporations or entities where part of your compensation was in the form of a stock award or a stock option. You were a partner in the ownership of that business. And many of us, through our 401ks or other means, own shares of stock in various corporations. So as I say, many businesses are owned by hundreds or even thousands of people. This morning, I want you to think with me, not in terms of a partnership with other human beings, but in terms of a partnership with God in his business. God said to Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. So Abraham partnered with God and a great nation was born. In fact, more than one great nation. God revealed the law through Moses. Moses wrote it down. He partnered with God in communicating his law to his people. And Jesus, when he was 12 years of age, said... 
I must be about my father's business. God's business, but Jesus, even as a boy, a partner in that business. When you think of God's business, remember two things. Remember first, God is the sole owner of the business. You and I are not part owners. God is the sole owner. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And Romans 14, 8. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. God is the sole owner of the business. So secondly, that means that you and I are stewards in his business. Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke, told the parable of a nobleman who went into a far country to be made king. And before his departure, he gave to each of his servants some money, some pounds. And when the king came back, he demanded that his servants give an account for what they had done with those pounds. But when the king left for the far country, he said to his servants, Occupy until I come. That is, make good use of my possessions until I come. That's what God has done with us. Jesus spiritually, through the Holy Spirit, is with us and in us. But in his physical body, Jesus has gone, if you please, to another country. He's at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And until he comes, he says to us, Occupy until I come. You put my possessions to good use because one day I'm coming back to hold you accountable. So those two things, God is the sole owner of the business and you and I are managers, stewards, his junior partners in his business. As the Bible says, we are partners or co-laborers with God. We depend totally upon God. But in a sense, God is depending on us. In a sense, He has no hands but our hands. He works through our hands. He has no feet but our feet. He takes His message using our feet. He has no voice but our voice. He speaks His word through our voice. And we are His partners until He comes back. So let me share with you several ways this morning in which we are partners with God. And let me ask you, what kind of a partner are you? First of all, we are partners with God in our time. Time is the most valuable commodity that you have. Your time is infinitely more valuable than your money. If you lost all your money, conceivably, you could find a way to earn some more money or someone might give it to you. But if you are out of time, you can never reclaim it. It is gone forever. And when life itself is past, you have transitioned into eternity and life on earth has come to an end. So in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, We are to redeem the time for the days are evil. That means make the most of every opportunity. Henry Thoreau said, You cannot kill time without injuring eternity. And Carlyle said, He who has no vision of eternity has no hold on time. Only one life, life, twill soon be past, 
only what's done for Christ will last. So are you a good steward with God? Are you a good partner with God in the way you use your time? Time is very short. 1 Chronicles 29. Our days on earth are as a shadow, the Bible says. In Job chapter 7. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. James 4.14 What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So life is very short. Are you spending your life in partnership with God? I heard of a pastor of a large church in a big city who developed with his congregation the reputation of being very punctual in his messages. Good reputation, right? Every Sunday he preached for 21 minutes exactly. Never under, never over. And he did it for so many years that his people began to brag about how punctual their pastor was. Until one day he began preaching. And he passed 21 minutes and 31 minutes and 41 minutes and an hour and 20 minutes. And finally he stopped at an hour and 21 minutes. And after the message, after the service, one of his members came to him and said, Pastor, whatever went wrong? Every week you preach exactly 21 minutes and you exceeded that by more than an hour. And the pastor said, well, it's like this. Every Sunday when I get in the pulpit, I reach into my pocket and I get a cough drop and I put it under my mouth, under my tongue. And that cough drop melts in exactly 21 minutes. And when the cough drop is gone, that's my sign to stop the sermon. But today when I stood up to preach and reached into my pocket, the cough drop turned out to be a button. So sometimes we're surprised at how long things go. But I will assure you, when you get to the end of life, you'll not be impressed with how long it was. You'll be impressed with how briefly, how quickly it passed you by. So we are stewards of our time. Your time belongs to God. It's an investment. Are you investing it in pursuits, in interests, in activities that will bring you a return in eternity? Or are you investing your time in things that will result in loss? Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Secondly, we are partners with God in our talents. Now God has given us talents. Jesus told a parable about this in Matthew 25. That Jesus called in three of his servants. And he gave to one five talents. And to another two talents. And to another one talent. And the day came when he asked his servants to come in. And to give a reckoning of how they had used their talents. And the one who had five talents had doubled them to ten. A talent was a sum of money. The one who had two talents had doubled it to four. But the one who had a single talent had buried it in the earth. And he said, here is your talent. And because he had brought no return on that talent, the owner said, Take his one talent away from him and give it to the man who has ten talents because I want it to be invested. I want it to grow. Now your talents don't belong to you. Your talents belong to God. A talent can be a natural talent. Something that you were born with a unique ability 
to do. Your talent can be an acquired skill, something you learn to do. Maybe at school, maybe on the job, maybe by watching someone else, maybe through the hard school of experience, but not necessarily something you were born with, something you developed. Your personality can be a talent. Some have a personality suited to working with people. Some have a personality suited to getting things done. Some have a personality suited to keeping everybody at peace and everybody on an even keel. Some have a personality suited to being students. But a personality can be a talent. And then God has given to each Christian one or more spiritual gifts. Some have the gift of using their musical talent for the glory of God. Some have a teaching gift. Some have a faith gift. Some have a ministry gift. But we all have one or more spiritual gifts. And of all of these, our talents, our gifts, a talent can be an interest. Something that you don't do for a living, but you're passionate about. Whatever your talent is, it really doesn't belong to you. It really ultimately belongs to you. To God. Now in business, the employees and the junior partner work for the good of the senior partner and of the business itself. You and I, in partnership with God, are not to be out here working so that we get a sense of fulfillment out of it, although we will. We're not out here using our talents so that others will notice and brag on us. But we are stewards of our talents for the good of the business, the kingdom of God, and for the glory and honor of the senior partner, the Lord Jesus Christ. Partners with God and our talents. Third, we are partners with God in our money, in our treasure. There's a verse in the Bible that is often misquoted and even more often misunderstood. It's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money, and here's the way it's misquoted, is the root of all evil. That's a mistranslation in the King James Version. Better translation, as the New International Version puts it. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Difference. The love of money is not the root of certain kinds of evil, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, many different kinds of evil. People will marry insincerely to get money. People will cheat to get money. People will kill to get money. People will lie and deceive to get money. And notice, the Bible doesn't say money is a root of all kinds of evil. It says the love of money. It's the desire for money. It's the craving for money. It's the lust for money, which is a root of all kinds of evil. The Bible says that all of our possessions belong to God. And when the Bible teaches tithing, all that we do is to give back a part of what already belongs to God. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Notice several things about the tithe. First of all, it's a command. Just as assuredly as God says, thou shalt not kill, God says, thou shalt tithe. Secondly, it is a command and one of the few things in the Bible that God says 
you test me in this. Many times it's a sin to put God to the test. But when it comes to tithing, God says, I want you to put me to the test. I want you to try this and see that I keep my word. Third, tithing is an act of worship. It's not just paying a debt. It's not just paying a bill. It's an act of worship to God. The Bible says, bring it into the storehouse. That's God's house. The Bible teaches that when people worshiped, they gave. Now, sometimes the giving is not money. You can fall on your knees at home and worship. But I submit to you, it is not real worship until you have given something. Again, you can fall on your knees at home and worship and give God your love, but you're giving something. You can give God your commitment, but you're giving something. And when I give God of my treasure, I am giving something. It is to be done in an act not of grudging necessity, not of guilt if I don't, it's given as an act of love and worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, tithing brings a blessing. See if I will not open the windows of heaven, the floodgates, and throw out upon you a blessing. Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, press down, shaken together and running over, now hear this, shall men give into your bosom. Sometimes we say, if I give, God will bless me spiritually. Yes, he will. But men don't give spiritual blessings. Men give physical blessings. Listen again to Jesus. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. And then the Bible says tithing honors God. Proverbs 3, 9, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. So my wealth belongs to the Lord and so does my tithe. Leviticus 27, 30, a tithe of everything from the land belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And fourth, we are partners with God in our work. And when I say work, I don't just mean work in the church. I mean all of our work. We are partners with God. The Bible says that we are saved by God's grace through faith. But Ephesians 2.10 continues, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're not saved through good works, but we are saved to good works. In Matthew 5.16, Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Not just what you do in the church. See your good works at home. See your good works at your business or your office. See your good works at the golf course that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. People need to see your witness. I read this week that if you lived in a village or a neighborhood of 100 people, here is what those 100 people would look like. Seven of those 100 people would be depressed, some of them considering suicide. Fourteen of those 100 people would be struggling with anxieties and fears to the point of really needing help, whether they get it or not. Another seven of those 100 people would be dependent on some chemical, whether alcohol, whether an illegal drug, whether a prescription medication. Three of those 100 people 
would be in the grief process through having lost a dear one in death. And 60 of those 100 people would have never made a profession of faith that Jesus Christ is their Savior and their Lord. So we are to let men see our good works and bring glory to God. We are to let men see the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 8, the man who plants and who waters have one purpose and each will be rewarded according to his own labor, partners with God in our works. And fifth, we are partners with God in sharing the gospel. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And those words are not only addressed to high churchmen somewhere, they're addressed to every Christian. And there are three ways in which you can preach. First of all, you can preach the gospel by sharing your experience. The Bible has a word for that, to give a testimony, to witness. Jesus said, you shall be witnesses unto me of all these things. Secondly, you can preach by a Christ-centered life. Titus chapter 2 verse 7. In all things show yourself a pattern of good works. In doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sermons which are seen are much more effective than sermons which are heard. And third, you can proclaim the gospel by giving money to make it possible for others to proclaim the gospel. You can give to one of the mission offerings. You can give of your tithes and offerings to your church. You can give above and beyond that to organizations outside the church that do God's work. But when you give to God's servants and when you give through God's church, you have a part in every person that is one to Christ in every life that's touched, in every need that's met, in every ministry that's carried out through your church. So begin 2016 by remembering that you are a partner with God. He is the sole owner of the business and you and I are stewards, co-laborers, partners in the business. And the scripture says... Moreover, it is required in a steward that a man or a woman be found faithful. Will you this year be found faithful in your partnership with the Lord? Let's stand together. In just a moment, we're going to sing our hymn of invitation. And it may be there's an area of your life where you need to say, Lord, I acknowledge that you are the sole owner. I want to be a faithful partner, a faithful steward. And the time of invitation for you would be a time of prayer and commitment to God's will. But it may be that you would like to come today and confess Christ as your Savior. Once you receive Him, a lot of other things will begin to make sense. And he'll bring into your life a peace and a joy that you've never known. Or perhaps you'd come today and join First Baptist Church by moving your membership. As we sing our hymn of invitation, God's Holy Spirit will call. Would you give him your life and let him make something beautiful and glorious to his name? Let's sing together.